Okay, so now that we have finished the base painting and I have combined it all onto one layer, so we can see all the things that that was built up on. It had sketches. And we kind of moved it all together. Now I'm going to, just to simplify, though digital painting often has just tons of layers, but I'm just going to put all of those into a group. The, the things that aren't needed anymore. And then we're going to start working on top of the base painting. And at this point, I have kind of a solid shape, right? So I know that whatever background, whatever blank background, I don't have holes that are going to get filled in with colors I don't anticipate, right? So I'm going to lock that. And now I'm going to start on the refined painting. So refined painting is when you start to zoom in a little bit. And there's a few tricks for this. Uh, one trick that works pretty well is so that you can zoom in and use more of your screen is you just take your reference image. So for your refined painting, you can take your reference image and you can just copy it into your refined painting image and just kind of set it off to the side. I might even get rid of all the white on that. And that makes it even easier to kind of steal color from it. But it's also nice to sometimes have it on screen. Another tool that you often use for refined painting is called the Navigator, because we're going to be zooming in a lot. So if you go to Window and Navigator, you'll see that we can not have to use the magnifying glass to zoom in. And not and not have to hold down the space bar to move around, right? But you see that my base painting layer, which was all 100% with my custom kind of rough brush, looks pretty pretty terrible from up close, right? It only starts to come together from a distance. So the navigator kind of helps keep your mind on the whole. And this actually gives me a, a fun little surrealistic idea maybe inspired by some of your presentations. It would be fun to make the uh, the photo of Heather into the tail. But anyway, silly ideas that digital art makes possible. OK, so we have this, our refined paint. I'm going to label the layer with um, Heather as my reference layer. And then I'm going to move my refined paint layer on top. And then I'm going to lock the reference layer because you don't want to accidentally paint on the wrong layers, right? Now for my refined paint layer, it's still going to be a normal layer at 100%, but I'm going to use the brush differently. So I, I want to still use my custom brush. You can always change brushes, but I warn against brushes that are too limited like too specific, like some of the built-in Photoshop brushes. And I have quite a few brushes, but ones like this. So you think, oh, this will make really great fur. It's like, you're not, you're not wrong. It can make really cool fur. It's kind of built in to mix between these colors. And we can set all of that in the, in the brush settings. That's what's called uh, color dynamics, right? But it can also be incredibly limiting in terms of you getting what you want from it. So let's say I use this, this brush and I steal this color and I mix it with this color, right? And then on the refined paint layer, I just start painting in the fur. Nothing wrong with that as long as I don't think that that's going to do the job for me all on its own, right? So if I have the navigator open, I can zoom in and show you what that looks like. So let me actually move that on top here.
So you can see that gives you a lot of detail very quickly. And that might be incredibly helpful depending on your subject matter, right? And you see how it has the angle. It's all under brush settings. So it has the, um, the shape dynamics with an angle jitter, so it, it keeps changing angle, which gives it that randomness. And that works because my dog's kind of sloppy looking anyway. Proudly sloppy looking. So I can do this, and I'm doing it at 100%, but then I need to know that I need to be able to modify it. I'm not going to be able to control this brush fully. And I can use different sizes of it. And I like the different color variations it's giving me mixing between but notice that this has a different feel now than this and i need my own brush to kind of bring it all together so beware of, of over relying on these kind of custom brushes though they can be helpful and remember you can always change color and cut into them but i'm not going to be able to finish off this painting in a way that i'm happy with just using this grass brush. But it can be a great kind of finishing technique. Okay, the biggest problem is that it's at 100% opacity. So it's overlapping everything I do. Now, if we took that down to a lower opacity, that's okay, but then it just looks faint, right? So how can we get those kind of effects in a more controllable way? Well, if we use a soft edge brush that we've designed and that we can control, so this is the one that, that I made, right? And if we play with its shape dynamics so that it has angle jitter, very important. I like to increase the roundness jitter so it changes um, its edge control a little bit. So it's really broken up. And I like to change its size so it's not always the exact same. I don't usually like to limit its minimum diameter. So just that makes the brush a lot more dynamic. I can also give it some texture so that it allows more space to be opened up, which helps it blend. So in painting, this would be like a scumble, like dry brush. So before I was using that large at 100%. For refined painting, I'm going to use it a little bit smaller and be zoomed in but I'm gonna use it at only about 60 or 70%. And now I can start blending, right? So let's put in some of these darks and start painting. And then I steal the in-between colors that are created. So if I really zoom in, you can see what that does. And remember, I'm not using a tablet so I don't have any pressure sensitivity for size, so I need to rely on that, that uh, size jitter in the brush settings. And notice I'm not going right for a main focal point to get a feeling for this. Instead, I'm working on kind of the big value ranges. And then I might decide, oh, I need to go a little bit smaller with this brush. And now let's work towards more detail. And I'm just holding down Option to steal from myself. But because it's only at 60%, notice I'm creating new tones and new colors every time I overlap and adding more and more complexity. And that's what's going to make the painting work up close a little bit better. And this is also where I can start to throw in some some color, right? So I put in that strong blue in the eyes. Because sometimes there's a slight green or bluish tint. And now I can just steal the colors from that, right? And then I can always put a highlight back in. And it's time consuming, but you can see how 
it's more controllable, right? So even though I'm going to use one brush consistently through this, the goal is for it not to just look like the same approach everywhere all the time. Now a tablet saves you a lot of time because you don't have to change your brush size. You can also set your brush with the tablet to be pressure sensitive for opacity, right? So if you press harder, it's more opaque. And if you press lighter, it's less opaque. That can be very helpful for digital painting as well. But without having a stylus to use, we don't have that option. And that's OK. This will give you full understanding of it. Now, if you have a stylus and tablet, by all means, use it. I don't want you to handicap yourself just because I am. But you don't need it in order to really build up something that's more believable. So now I'm getting to the focal point with the eyes, because that's going to tell me if, if this level of finish is going to work. Right? And that's why digital painting can be so time consuming, especially if you're going for realism. It's really hard to say when you're finished. Because you can always zoom in more and do more and more detail. The reason the speed paintings kind of work is because they're only at screen resolution, right? And from a distance, you can make something look pretty, pretty polished without having to take a whole lot of time. I can see the little blue in the fur, you know, from the reference. So I can even use that in other places as well. And the reason I like having the navigator open is you want to be reminded that you're, you're working on the whole thing. You don't want to just get stuck in details, especially because we're trying to turn this in today. So we're pushing ourselves, working fast. This is the first of the first demo I've done of a pet that I've owned. And it's fun to play with her expressions. <laughs> the power you have as the digital portrait artist. And of course, to get better at these skills requires more than just playing with Photoshop. Traditional painting classes, observational drawing, exercises, sketching, you know, looking at still lifes, understanding how shadows form shadows, how color theory works, all of that's going to improve your digital painting. But it is fun to just have all these tools right at your fingertips. As you get more refined, I'm going to go to a lower opacity, right? So that it becomes more like I'm glazing with transparent layers. And sometimes I'll do a couple refined layers, not just one. Because the, the more transparent your brush, the more subtlety you can get, but the longer it takes to build up the effects. So my approach to being kind of consistent at this stage and finishing it off is to try to limit the number of brushes you use. But it really should be more than just one, especially if you don't have a tablet to help vary it. So I think that this grass brush, I like the color mixer that's built in. Go back to it. Let's see, does it keep it in my memory? That would be nice. Nope. 